Please stay tuned for important disclosure information at the conclusion of this episode. Welcome to the Investing Insights Podcast from Morningstar. In this week's special episode, Greg Warren from Morningstar Research Services and Susan Jabinski from Morningstar Inc. tell us everything we need to know about Warren Buffett and Berkshire Hathaway. Hi, I'm Susan Jabinski with Morningstar. Berkshire Hathaway's annual meeting is on Saturday. Joining me today to discuss some of Berkshire's recent moves, the firm's valuation, and questions he'd like to see answered during the meeting is Greg Warren. Greg is a senior analyst in Morningstar's equity research group, specializing in asset managers. He's also Morningstar's analyst on Berkshire. Hi, Greg. Nice to see you today. Thanks for having me. So um, Berkshire's had a pretty busy year by Berkshire standards in 2022, putting cash to work. Um, Tell us a little bit about how much cash was on the books coming into the year. And, you know, if you were surprised by the activity we've seen so far. Well, we we look at Berkshire's sort of cash availability. We we tend to sort of think about the dry powder they have available to put in investments and acquisitions and into share purchases. And by that measure, they had about $112 billion um, coming into 2022. Now that varies from the 147 billion that was on the balance sheet, but you know Buffett's always like to keep about a 30 billion dollar backstop there for the reinsurance business <clears throat> and the insurance businesses, and we've got some operating cash and some funding for for near term sort of capex. So overall, that works us back down to that 112 billion dollar uh, figure. Now, as you said, they've been pretty busy, you know, this year. We, we've been a little bit surprised by that. Um, you know, especially with what they've bought. I mean, on the Occidental Petroleum front, uh, they put about $12 billion to work uh, in shares, you know, sort of spread out over the first quarter. Um, and that's interesting because they have warrants to buy 84 million shares for just under $60 um, from Oxy as part of the investment they made, you know, a few years back where they got the $10 billion preferred stock in the company. Um, you know, at this point right now, I think they're sitting around about 17% of the company from a from a uh, outstanding share perspective. So it, it just seems a little bit odd, but again, I think they were sort of, you know, tapping into the rise in oil prices which are getting back up to where, you know, some expect might be more normalized levels. Um, HP was interesting, a little bit over 4 billion, seemed a little odd to us, not really the kind of stock that you know Buffett would typically invest in. I mean, I know he has holdings in Apple, but it seems to be, us to be a little bit more like IBM, where they bought the stock a few years back. You know, the company had good free cash flows. The company paid a good dividend. Um, I think that might be some of it. Um, the more interesting piece, though, was the Allegheny, or the Allegheny purchase. Um, about $12 billion there. Um, pure Buffett. You know, he met with management. He put a price down. And he told the Allegheny to go out and see if they could get a better price. Um, so overall, we think it's a good deal. It's a good fit for Berkshire, reinsurance business, especially lines. Um, Allegheny Capital is also a, a good part of that business, which kind of reminds us a little bit of, you know, sort of the MSR segment at Berkshire, the manufacturing service and retailing, <clears throat> and some of the ca- capital allocation stuff that Buffett does from corporate. So a very interesting deal, and we feel it's a good lucrative deal for Berkshire to do. So going back to Oxy for a minute, you know, how, how big is that position right now? And do you think that there's a chance that Berkshire will buy the whole company? Yeah, at this point, like, I think I misspoke a little bit earlier. It's about a 15% stake. Um, if they were to exercise the warrants, which is possible right now because the stock is trading, you know, above $60, um, with the dilution that would come from that exercise, it would be about a 21% stake in the firm. This... A little bit contrary to what Berkshire and Buffett have liked to sort of, you know, do in the past, where they were taking five, ten percent equity stakes, and rarely moving beyond that. I mean, yeah, Coke is higher than that, American Express is higher than that, but a lot of that sort of legacy holdings, things they bought in the '70s and the '80s. So from that perspective, it's just been, you know, attrition over time. Um, and then, you know, they did sort of winnow down their bank holdings the past couple of years and put a lot more behind Bank of America, pushed it above that ten percent threshold. But it's rare to see them step in, you know, somewhat that aggressively. Um, and <clears throat> even though Buffett has had a poor track record of investing in energy or commodity-related securities, they've had a really good track record when it comes to buying companies outright. Mm-hmm. You know, Berkshire Hathaway Energy is, is kind of a crown jewel within the portfolio overall. This is a slightly different business. Um, but at the same time, it wouldn't surprise me if they were to go out and buy the firm. And I think based on what they were to got invested, 
they could do it for maybe another forty billion. So that would you know they plan plenty of cash on the books to do that. Let's probe a little bit more on um, Allegheny. Um, what do you think of the purchase price there? You know, uh, do, how, what sort of value do you think this can add to Berkshire over time? Yeah, I, th- I thought the purchase price was pretty good. I mean, it ended up being about one point two six times book. Um, the stock has traded maybe one ten ish historically, a little bit higher maybe um, on average. So there is a premium there. <clears throat> um, I, I think the key here for Berkshire, I mean, they, they had a 25-day go shop um, clause built into the, the deal. Basically gave Allegheny the opportunity to go out and solicit bids. Um, um, and they did go out and do more than 30 um, solicitations with their advisors. But nobody came back to the table with a bid that was going to match what, what Berkshire was doing. They were paying all cash. Um, you know, I think the valuation is attractive. And when we really sort of dug through the results and ran <clears throat> um, what our expectations would be for the different businesses as well as the uh, investment portfolio, we think it's a, a, a pretty good uh, a deal for Berkshire. It's probably, it, it, with our current change in fair value, it accounted for, I think, 16000 of the Class A share increase and about $11 of the Class B. So a, a decent contribution overall. Um, you know, overall, they've done a good job with those businesses. We're not really building in a whole lot of earned premium growth overall. Uh, where we see the biggest opportunity for the underwriting side is on the expense side. Um, I think being part of a larger organization, they can sort of scale up some of these businesses and actually help improve their expense ratio, which would be good for them because reinsurance is a, at best a break-even business. Mm-hmm. You know, and the value you really get is from the investment portfolio. And that's where I think Berkshire can actually unlock a lot of additional value. You know, if we look at the portfolio at uh, Allegheny, it's been maybe 15%, 20% equities the past five years. Berkshire's portfolio is about 90. Mm-hmm. So they can swip that if they could just flip it uh, uh, on its head <clears throat> and do 75 you know, percent equities, a uh, big incremental value creator for them over time. I don't see any problem with regulators. You know, the regulators have generally been okay with Berkshire um, investing heavily in equities because they have so much cash and additional uh, uh, fixed income on the books. So you know, overall, I think there's a big value creator there. And then on the Allegheny Capital piece, you know, taking a group that has historically been acquisitive and giving them access to the capital that Berkshire has you know, available, we think that this could be one of those areas where we could finally start to see some bolt-on and, and additional acquisitions within the MSR segment where we feel it's been lacking in the past five, mm-hmm. ten years. Now, you referred to you know a change in the fair value as, as a result of Allegheny. Talk a little bit about what um, effect these you know recent purchases in this activity in the first quarter has had on our fair value estimate. What do we think Berkshire's worth today? Yeah, I mean, the, the, the fair value, like I said, we added 16000 to the Class A shares and the total overall value increase was 25 on the Class A's. So, you know, the rest of it, the nine there, is coming from uh, the investments in the equity securities, so taking it from a cash pile and moving it into an actual mm-hmm. investment, um, um, you know, part of the portfolio, uh, but also sort of where values were on um, the security since the previous time we updated mm-hmm. you know, the fair value. Because we had, you know, Apple, American Express, Bank of America actually increased in value from the time at which we last updated the, the model overall. So there's some contribution from that as well. You know, so that really helped. You know, on an overall basis, we took the fair value from, you know, 525000 on the Class A's, 350 on the Class B's to 550 and then 367 on the Class B's overall. So not a huge increase, mm-hmm. but it is, it is meaningful for a firm like Berkshire. I mean, you know, a company of this size getting that sort of, you know, benefit from, you know, what ended up being just sort of a handful of transactions. So as we noted at the top of the video, you know, this weekend Berkshire's holding its annual meeting. It's the first time uh, Berkshire's having an in-person meeting since the pandemic. So, and you're going, um, what do you expect to hear during this meeting? Yeah, it'll, it'll be interesting to see how the meeting goes because prior to the COVID outbreak, they had actually started to make some changes in how the, the meeting, the Q&A segment in particular, was going to uh, take place. Prior to that, uh, they had an analyst panel and a journalist panel. So three journalists, three analysts, and then questions would also come from shareholders, and they would sort of run the round robin mm-hmm. um, through the course of the meeting. <clears throat> now, prior to the 2020 meeting, Buffett had decided that you know he wanted to have Greg Abel, who is now, as we know, the, the next CEO, 
um, and Aji Jane up there answering questions as well as you know him and Charlie. Um, so they, you know, changed the the format for the staging, and the, the intention was to still have the three journalists, um, but because of COVID, right. they kind of had to dial it in for for a couple of years there. You know, I think Becky Quick is sort of now taking up the sole journalist position, asking questions. So she's fielding questions from shareholders and other interested parties, and then left shareholders at the at the meeting actually asking questions and then sort of rotating through that. Um, as at any meeting, I, I always look for nuggets that might come out about um, the operating businesses, long-term strategies, competitive positioning, you know how they think about capital allocation. You know, the, you know the things that we really sort of pressed on the years that we were on the analyst panel. Really tried to get, sort of get Buffett to sort of give us some some clarity on. Um, I'm hopeful that that happens. I'm not crossing my fingers, <laughs> but but it's you know it'll be interesting to see what happens. I mean, I'm kind of curious to see how this meeting goes. Um, you know, when we look back, the reason that they actually brought the analysts in the first place and the journalists too was they felt like they weren't getting enough good questions about the businesses. And you know, we're, we're hopeful that we'll still keep getting a lot of good sort of business-related questions that help us with our evaluation, our understanding. So give me two or three questions that you'd like answered when you're, when you're there this weekend. Yeah, I mean, there's, there's core operating issues that still kind of gnaw at me. And there's, <laughs> there's definitely some capital allocation questions and, and definitely some questions, I think, related to Allegheny. Um, <clears throat> but just on <clears throat> like the core operating side, you know, I've been on them for a long time about Geico, you know, and just why don't they have telematics? Why are they not committed to, you know, setting up a system that's going to allow, allow them to underwrite better than they have been? You know, because we've started to really see sort of a spread <clears throat> in the performance between them and Progressive, mm. which is really their closest peer. You know, Progressive has telematics. Um, you know, it, it's the same thing with the, the BNSF on the railroad side. You know, they, they are the lone holdout on adopting precision scale scheduled railroading. You know, their peers right now are, you know, expanding their, their operating ratios are, are looking a lot better than, than BNSF. And what worries me over the long run with both companies is, you know, you end up getting priced out of uh, uh, policies or, or priced out of, you know, volume <clears throat> because your peers have margin that they can basically sort of turn back on you and use it to undercut you on price. So I think that you know, there's some real issues there that I think need to be answered, and they've never really given full, good, serious answers to. And I think, it, again, I think those are the kind of questions that need to be hammered again and again and again. Um, on the capital allocation front, you know, I'd really be curious to see how they feel about cash reserves. Is that $30 billion now enough? With Allegheny in the portfolio, does it need to go to 40? Because Allegheny is predominantly reinsurance, which is a lot lumpier, a lot more volatile, you know, you have big losses in any you know given period of time. You know, do they need to to up that? Um, and then the cash management front. You know, how do we think about? You know, so far share repurchases have really sort of helped them. Mm -hmm. You know, really helped them sort of whittle down the cash balances, mm -hmm. keep them from getting above that 150 billion dollar threshold that Buff has said he's not comfortable with. Um, but you know, it, it seems like this year they might buy themselves some time mm -hmm. with these investments yeah. they've done and with the deals that they've done. But if you think about HP, um, Oxy, and, and Allegheny combined, that's less than the amount of free cash flow they're going to generate this year. Hmm. So, right. so they, they have a cash problem. It just keeps building and building and building unless they find effective ways to get it put to work. So do you see the share repurchases continuing? And do you think we're ever going to see a dividend from Berkshire? Um, Absolutely on the share purchases. They, that is really their only legitimate outlet. When, when valuations are too high and they can't invest in anything, um, it, it's the only way they can put money to work. Um, and, you know, they've actually been slightly above what my run rate was for a while there. They were doing about six, six and a half billion a quarter, you know, the past two years. Mm -hmm. My original estimation was about five to seven billion. I've mm -hmm. since increased that to about six to eight billion a quarter that they could easily do. Um, I think in periods when they have investment activity, it's probably be at the lower end of that, maybe even yeah. below that. But I think that you know over time, the expectation should be they're going to do that kind of level of share purchase. That's about twenty five billion, you know, a year, um, you know, give or take that we sort of build into our forecast. Um, but we'll have to see. I mean, the, it, it is something that's palatable to Buffett. Mm -hmm. he, he will never pay a dividend. <laughs> it, it will never happen as long as he has a life. 
Yeah, I think part of that is because he's just dead set to get it. He doesn't like to give away something and not get something in return. <laughs> um, and I think the other thing is that I think he still wants to leave that as a tool for the next guys because they're going to have to have something to sort of placate, you know, longer term investors to convince them to continue to stay with the firm, you know, while they figure out how best to handle capital allocation over the long run. That's interesting. So uh, let's let's talk a little bit specifically about Warren Buffett as an investor. You know, how would you, you know, in a couple sentences, really define his approach? And what what are the things that really matter to him as an investor? Um, I, I think he looks at, you know, we always think about the stock investments, but it, it, he, at the end of the day, is, would prefer to buy a company outright. He'd rather have the whole kit and caboodle. He doesn't want to, you know, he doesn't really want to mess around with partial ownership, um, you know, mainly because there's a lot of reporting requirements and other things that go with that. <laughs> and just, you know, things that you know, he's not comfortable with. Or, you know, it, he feels sometimes that he's not getting a meaningful enough piece of the pie to have it have an impact on Berkshire overall. I mean, if we think about, um, like, Apple. Apple is their single largest holding in the investment portfolio. It's 45% of the equities. Mm -hmm. um, it's only about 5% of Apple's stake, you know, outstanding shares. So there's a situation where they could put a ton of money to work and ha not have a big debt. Mm -hmm. Now, there's a lot of companies, if they were to put that amount of capital to work, it would be the whole company. You know, so it's kind of hard for them to do from, from that respect. But I think when he, when he looks at companies, he's always trying to find, you know, either investments or acquisitions that are going to be meaningful you know, for them. Um, companies that have a consistent track record of, of, of generating good, you know, results, um, good returns on equity, little to no debt, you know, highly qualified management in place, um, and then a, a, a good reasonable price you know, based on how they're looking at the, the business, you know, for them to sort of step into. And those types of investments, he would prefer to buy and hold forever. Mm -hmm. You know, again, you know, he, he'd like to have the outright, but, you know, from the stock perspective, there's a few securities in the portfolio that have been there for a very, very long time. Mm -hmm. um, we have seen things come and go over the years, so he's not adverse to selling when conditions change or when, you know, the contribution they're getting from that business no longer um, is... Uh, what they had expected it to be in the past. Or, you know, a good interesting case in point, they had P&G for, for a very long time. They came out of the Gillette mm -hmm. um, state that they had acquired many years ago. <clears throat> and, you know, they actually swapped stock for, for the Duracell business. Mm -hmm. So they got a cash flow generating business, <clears throat> brought it in and out, right? And then they sold off a lot of the rest because they were trying to raise capital for, for Ted Wechsler and Todd Combs to work with. So. I think from that perspective, there's opportunities for them to sort of take money off the table when the, the you know, holding itself doesn't necessarily mean as much to them as it did in the past or where it's not as, as integral, it's not as big of a piece. I mean, we saw that also with the bank companies. They, at that one time, I think they had stakes in 10 different banks. Mm -hmm. You know, they since sold off most of those and funneled the proceeds into Bank of America. Mm -hmm. So they increased it above the 10% the threshold, mainly because the, the Fed had changed sort of their policies upon um, bank holding company reporting and everything mm -hmm. else. It's sort of made a big gray area beyond 10%, sort of in that 10 to 20% realm where, you know, Buffett has actually been able to sort of build the best stake and not have the feds come in and, you know, require more from them yeah. from a reporting perspective. So given all that, what would you say are some, a few key takeaways or key principles that an individual stock investor, say, can take away from Warren Buffett and learn from Warren Buffett? Uh, just, just quick, quirky <laughs> comments over the years. I mean, yeah, the, I think the key one is, you know, be greedy when others are fearful and fearful when others are greedy. Um, it's probably one of his more recent and, and more famous ones. Um, yeah, I, I think, you know, you know, Basically, stick to companies with sustainable competitive advantages, you know, which is what we call economic moats. Um, I think he's he's big on you know compounding, you know reinvesting your profits, you know um, keeping them and letting compounding do its work. Um, you know he's as I said earlier, little to no debt you know, is, is basically your friend. Um, it, just a lot of little things that that seem simple. But they've actually helped them sort of build what they have over the years. And, and the thing is, is you know, Buffett, <clears throat> if anything, they've really stuck to their discipline. 
You know, and I think we saw this with the Allegheny deal more recently. I think one of my biggest complaints about Berkshire over the years is that they have this very strict investment discipline where they put the bid on the table, they won't do any auctions, they won't do, engage in bidding wars, they won't come back with the second ar offer. And that's great if nobody else can top your, your bid, mm -hmm. you know, but Buffett always likes a deal. <laughs> um, and, you know, it, we've kind of made the point that that's, that lack of a dividend and lack of share of purchase for many, many years allowed so much cash to build up on the, on the balance sheet. Um, but it also works. It keeps them from overpaying for things. It keeps them from, you know, getting into a bidding war where they end up not getting the same sort of return they were expecting mm -hmm. in, the, in the first place. You know, and right now there is so much capital out there, you know, especially private capital, that's bidding for assets that it, it doesn't make any sense to get into you know, bidding wars, especially with valuations where they are. So I think from that perspective, he's he's been very good and very consistent. Um, I'd still like to see some wiggle room longer term. I'll have to talk to Greg <laughs> Abel and see what he thinks about that. But, you know, I, I think this opportunity is definitely where you can sort of, you know, step in and tweak the deal a little bit and not and still be true to your to, to your discipline. Greg, thank you so much for your time today and your insights. I know you've been following Berkshire for a long long time. I hope you get your questions answered at the meeting this this coming weekend and I look forward to reading your recap after you've been there. We appreciate your time. Thanks for having me. I'm Susan Jabinski with Morningstar. Thanks for tuning in. That does it for this week's Investing Insights podcast from Morningstar. We hope you have enjoyed our program and we welcome your feedback. Please send your comments and questions to podcast at Morningstar.com. From everyone here at Morningstar, thanks for listening. This recording is for informational purposes only and should not be considered investment advice. Opinions expressed are as of the date of recording. Such opinions are subject to change. The views and opinions of guests on this program are not necessarily those of Morningstar Inc. and its affiliates. Morningstar and its affiliates are not affiliated with this guest or his or her business affiliates unless otherwise stated. Morningstar does not guarantee the accuracy or the completeness of the data presented herein. The podcast is for informational purposes only and should not be considered tax advice. Please consult a tax and or financial professional for advice specific to your individual circumstances. Morningstar Research Services LLC is a subsidiary of Morningstar Inc. and is registered with and governed by the U.S. Securities and Exchange Commission. Morningstar Research Services shall not be responsible for any trading decisions, damages, or other losses resulting from or related to the information, data analysis, or opinions or their use. Past performance is not a guarantee of future results. All investments are subject to investment risk, including possible loss of principal. Individuals should seriously consider if an investment is suitable for them by referencing their own financial position, investment objectives, and risk profile before making any investment decision.